I'm here to talk about the future of creativity, as he said, and ooh, Prezi. Um, I want to start by talking about my 20-somethings, because everything I can tell you about the future of creativity, I'm actually learning by watching these young people in my office and how they work. And um, you know, there's some good news and some bad news. They're just connected with each other and their social circles in some incredibly powerful ways. Um, but they do have trouble crossing the street uh, without getting killed. Um, so you, it, by watching, how, you, know, you can't call them. You've got to like chat them. You're, you're two desks over in an open office space. So you know, they're different. And it, I think thinking about how they're different and the social context in which they reside helps us understand what the future of creativity will be. And you'll pardon me for telling you a joke. It's a very short joke. It's about the Dalai Lama. He walks into a pizza parlor and he says, make me one with everything. <laughs> and, uh, thank you. I appreciate that. So maybe, you know, the internet and all of this connectivity that we have, I, I, I kind of feel like we're all Buddhists now. You know, we're all connected to each other. And that's a really cool thing because I spent, I spent uh, a decade in Asia, and when I came back, um, I had lost track. You know, this is around 2001 I came back with a lot of friends. And I really missed all that global context of knowing people intimately and, and uh, understanding them and the different cultures that we were interacting with. But nowadays, here it is only three years ago, uh, maybe uh, probably five, I guess, now, I'm connected with Dick Von Mottman, I know, when he's going to a, a gallery show in Singapore. I know uh, what Kaz Maezawa is doing in terms of singing and, and you know, karaoke in Tokyo, and yes, if, don't knock it if you haven't tried it. Um, also, you know, Kweku Umono, uh, a, a buddy of mine who's in Seoul teaching black lit. And I can, here it is, it's coming in on my phone. And that's really cool. And this social context I want to use as a kind of um, a way to, to bridge into three different areas, one of which we'll talk about um, uh, um, uh, cloud participation. Another area we're going to talk about is globalization. And I want to turn it around because uh, I want some action steps. I think we've got to think about Vermont a bit. I want to ask you to participate uh, in a creative thinking about Vermont. All right, so let's go in. I want to talk about cloud crowd uh, participation. And, I don't want to say this is all the internet, because we're talking about technology, technology, technology. A lot of this stuff, I mean, think. I, I was in uh, Burlington, um, 1980, 81, 82, which I, I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the state. Uh, because these crazies, these Ben and Jerry started up this ice cream scoop shop. And you know what? Talk about tribal. Talk about participatory. Uh, talk about this brand that they created that was so inviting. And things like, uh, you know, the, uh, I've got the Rainforest Crunch up there, if you remember when that came out. Uh, and, uh, you know, Who's Afraid of the Doughboy. And uh, uh, so wonderfully uh, a countercultural, yet still having fun, yet engaging with the world. And um, so and Vermont's been great at this. In many ways, many of the things in the firms, uh, what firms are doing now is, is to some degree replicating some of this participatory pieces. I want to tell you some other stories around Vermont that just spark my interest. Um, this uh, Beth Robinson, no relation to Ken that I know of, um, has this great business in my building in, in Pine Street, oh, you know where Steve Conant Coast Custom Brass is? And she makes these crazy dolls. And I'm thinking, well, look what the internet has done to allow her to have a vocation to make these one-off, the kind, kind of morbid, crazy dolls. And they are just tremendous. Here we see Blind po Poet at the top and Stitch Bitch in the upper right. <laughs> and we have uh, Lady Oriel on the lower left. She sells them off this website. And so look how networked that we are that even something this niche can be a viable business. I have another friend, um, Dave Brown. He's actually a retiring orthopedic surgeon in Omaha, Nebraska. And He's got a passion for golf, in fact, old-timey golf, and uh, he actually is making replica golf balls. On the left here, you see the uh, uh, line-cut gutta percha replicas from the 1890s, and then there's a bramble pattern from 1905, and then there's a couple uh, other patterns as well from the 20s and 30s. And I'm thinking, how do you make a business out of this? And you know what? He's doing it. And what we've, he's been able to, and you can't believe the orders uh, coming in from Sweden, uh, from Japan, from Edinburgh, and there's the golf courses love them, and they're ordering them up. And I think, what a wonderful world that we are, that we can have the way, very niche uh, um, 
verticals can actually do and play well. And by the way, that's a great thought for a place like Vermont. And because I want to tell you a story about Hill Farmstead uh, Brewery, which is just a tremendous story. They are in Greensboro, Vermont. And if you don't know where that is, picture a triangle between Morrisville, Newport, and St. Johnsbury. This is rural. This is a hike. And he's got a, a little thing here. And this this uh, uh, fella, Sean Hill, has just been voted the world's top brewer for 2013. Amongst 14,000 worldwide breweries. And, you know, what, what is he doing? And his, the, the passionate following is so great. Here's a tweet. He goes, hey, tomorrow is dandelion picking day. And so everyone's out, you know, picking dandelions and they're putting in things. It's so participatory. The, the passion is so strong. I just can't imagine Budweiser sending out a treat, a treat saying, hey, let's get some rice. We're going to like, you know, we're brewing today. Um, so the scale and this passion, uh, especially in the 20-somethings, is really um, uh, incredible. And here we're taking a look. Uh, he's got, actually, this is uh, on Tuesday, he's got something going on. You may want to put it on your calendars. He's got someone coming in for Denmark, someone from the Netherlands, someone from Norway, and someone from Belgium. So people, it's not just like cats coming up from a Boston kind of thing. This is a worldwide set of craft brewers that he's ro uh, risen to the top of. Now the question is, well, how, how can he do that? And the answer is that people are networking themselves in through these websites. And this on the left is Beer Advocate, and on the right you're taking a look at Rate Beer. And they go on in and they uh, organize themselves. And it, it's not just the, it's not, you know, as if craft brewery is not narrow enough. I can go in and do um, Pilsners, I can do Hefeweizen, right? It's, it's amazing. And I think we're gonna see more of that as we look at the future of, of creativity. And I also want to say this is I, I can, you know, I'm old enough, I'm 49, so you know the future is a lot closer than it used to be. Um, <laughs> but as I'm looking at these, and nothing makes you feel old than like being around 20 somethings. And I have to have a 30 something. So I say someone like if I say something like Walter Cronkite, someone uh, has to go. Walter Cronkite was a third, was a person who <laughs> on CBS, you know. Like, I can, you know, I. I I love the band Devo, but you know, nobody, you have to, yes. these kids I come out working, you know, they were born after Devo's hits had passed. <laughs> but I digress. So boosters and what's happening is you don't really need to, to denigrate. I mean, I, I remember Gene Shalit or uh, Roger Ebert or all these, there, was, there were critics and they were the proxies for the knowledge of what was good and bad. And I think it's important to understand that in places like Rate Beauty, I, I don't care about the man telling me it. I care about my social network. And so my 20-somethings are there, and they network themselves together. It's much more credible to get that uh, interest for them. And by the way, if it, something sucks, I don't need to talk about it sucking, because it, there's, there's lists, there's top 10. I'm just interested in what's good and cool. And if it's not good and cool, it doesn't get on my screen. So it's important to think about this boosterism and, and to court it. And I think that's a very positive thing for creativity as we look ahead. Um, and crowd uh, financing. There's a whole bunch of, of items that are taking down the barriers between you as a creative individual and getting that creative entity into the world. And we're looking at, we took, I've heard uh, Kickstarter mentioned a couple times today, and this is just amazing. Here's someone who's a young man, Trevor, I think he's around 13, and he wants to get some uh, equipment together so he can make more uh, maple syrup. And he's put up on a Kickstarter, he wants 800 bucks. Well, guess what? As of the day I took the screen swipe, he's at 175% uh, funded and he's got 1,200 bucks. <laughs> he did not need to go to a bank. All he needed to do was make a video, right? He can use his cell phone and make that. And that's um, the whole idea of your being able to use your own social context, not only to, to be inspired by, but to work and bounce things off of, and ultimately to facilitate into the real world is happening. And it's, it's uh, changing the way we think about things. Another way I like to talk about my 20-somethings, uh, and I've got a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old uh, in my household, and so this is also kind of close to home, um, is that they're, they were raised with, with video games. And I see this spilling over. If you see these apps on your phone, for example, um, the place-based apps uh, will give you little points and make you the mayor of a town and all these things. And they're used to growing up in this world. 
And we, have, we were working with a client, this is a Vermont Electric Co-op, and imagine that we're in a community, bless its soul, very concerned with sustainability. And as it touches energy, it's a, it's a challenge. And well, so we started saying, you know, the trouble was when they have the annual meeting to get everybody together, these people don't like wind. These people don't like oil. These people don't like natural gas. These, and the trouble is for a Vermont Electric Co-op, they got to like get everyone together to decide. And so what we started to do is actually create a game. You're looking at some on the upper right. You must fund the grid. You can't make a moral choice not to fund it. <laughs> it's role playing. So you can check. Here, here's nuclear. Here's your hydro. Here's your and, and it takes into consideration the way you make the back end that if thing, certain sources are intermittent. Solar, it's sometimes on, sometimes off. Wind, sometimes on, sometimes off. But you can game the back end and say, OK, guys, I'm your cooperative. I'm going to let you make that choice within the parameters of this game and go tell it, tell us. And so this is getting built out. And by the way, what that does is also have your choices that you make have a per kilowatt hour and a monthly bill so you can understand the context for that. But I, I share this because I think there's a lot of room to take complex issues. I don't know if anyone played the New York Times balance the US budget puzzle is like that. Tremendous, well, you will learn so much more by making some choices. Hey, let's no longer fund uh, you know, foreign diplomacy. Take it all out. And military, you know, you, can, it, it, you learn so much more through that. You know, we even kind of did some stuff which is almost like nutrition labeling to say, okay, hey, here's, here, right? here's, the, here's the EC's share, here's the national share, here's you know, the carbon emissions. So that there's a platform for, sure, for shared knowledge which allows people to make better decisions. I want to talk about globalization for a second, because insofar as we're in this, we're so early on this curve. Right now, 1.5 billion people have social media, the statistics I can find, and that's, there's 7 billion people in the world. And I, I like William Gibson's quote here, it says, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed yet. <laughs> so um, I know what the future is like, because we're traveling down that. And we're looking at a world in which the United States, this is in blue, has been heavily dominant in terms of the usage of the internet. But as we move to the right over into today, you can see China, India coming online. We are not the most populous nation in the world. And what that's gonna mean is that the framework changes. We're gonna to have to learn uh, new names for new platforms like Kontakte in Russia or Qzone in China, where many people are interacting. Those aren't our platforms. And when they're not our platforms, we gain new perspectives, which is why I'm fundamentally excited by this, I'm not threatened by it. I think that's super. And the, uh, I think the other thing to recognize is sometimes what we learn, we're not always going to be so comfortable with. It'll challenge our own understandings of ourselves. Now that I brought you down, sorry about that. Um, I want to talk about Vermont's creative challenge. You know, there's a Vermont, there's a endangered species. You know, we've done a really good job with our natural environment. But taking a look at our 20-somethings, and I see this, and it's painful. And I, I'm here today to ask you for your help in participating in a creative future that would be really wonderful for, all, for us to tackle, which is how to have jobs for 20-somethings. Because we have aging boomers, and we're creating a medical system that's going to treat them very well in terms of what we can serve them with. But guess what usually funds this? <coughs> Young folks. You take that out, that's a challenge. I, I like uh, uh, you know, to think about this as, can we christen ourselves not only as natural environmentalists, but economic environmentalists? And think of those things together, because the one supports the other. If we want several million dollars to clean the lake, we need the economy to be robust enough to go do those things. And the one can help the other. We're a great place to live. The challenge here by Dave Parker from Dealer.com, he said in an Excite show in Burlington, Vermont without economic growth, growth uh, will be an insolvent retirement community, but with really great skiing. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's kind of grim, but here's the challenge. As we look, as firms such as mine, as Dealer.com, as my web grocers look to go actually go out and um, embrace things and grow and find programmers and the people in need, we have a challenge. Because what we've been doing, and it's because we've been serving ag, ag and tur tourism for very good reasons, is we've kind of put ourselves, you know, the latest technology we show is from 1890. It's a barn. <laughs> and that's a challenge. And so I ask, can we rethink what I call bucolic bumpkinism? <laughs> I, I, I love, look, we can be n nature, but there's so many cool things in this state that the world needs that we can embrace that I just want it to be forward looking. 
And there's a part of us that's backward looking. I want us to be aware of that. Because when we're going to find people, you know, our brand equities are associated with the past. And those may not be the industries. I'm pretty sure they may not be the industries of our future. They're part of our future. Even more important, the food cycle and local war and all that stuff. Hey, we can do that and inform the world. So there's some great stuff going on. And we think about, hey, in many ways, we're, it's like we're a tech state dressed in cow's clothing. You know, here's, I've got, here is the chip that just kicked humanity's butt in jeopardy, produced right here by the software engineers. We do not talk about that. That's a crime. We, that's $1 billion worth of our $6 billion economy coming right out of that plant. And I know there's been some, some layoffs, so that's a, uh, sad. But there's all sorts of other stuff. MMIC's making these mobile hospital uh, planes that go in, you fly into a place and you can um, uh, do eye surgery. Uh, they're doing up that up in St. Johnsbury. Selden is actually sitting around uh, making water, nanotechnology for water for South Africa. Uh, you, you, and that's beyond the, the well-known stuff, like seventh generation and um, the fair trade uh, pieces of Green Mountain Coffee Roasters. This is a really neat story. So I want to just elevate it up if we can. Think Switzerland. I can keep cowbells in my head. I got, you know, people walking in clover. That's super. But I can also keep a great financially strong industry. I can keep manufacturing of watches at high end all together. And I think that we can think about holding that together. That would be great. I like Joe Fusco's quote uh, recently. There was an economic for forum down in, um, in Rutland. And he said, he actually said, you know, Vermont is anti-business. And there's a murmur kind of went through the crowd. He said, hold on, before you, you know, fry me here, he says, you know, Vermont's anti-business in the way that Apple is anti-technology. You know, I think there's a vision. I think that there's enough threads here that we can pull this together. And his quote was, hey, live differently, lead differently, profit differently. And I thought, boy, there's a seed for this that can hold both the economic aspects of our state and uh, all the wonderful heritage that we've built up in agriculture, et cetera. And I think there's a chance then to welcome Vermont entrepreneurs and indeed be one with everything. Thank you. <laughs>